Hi, everyone. Welcome to Here We Are, Brattleboro's community talk show. I'm Wendy O'Connell, and we are still recording off-site, but we are doing a good job, I think, of it because we're all supporting each other, and we know that in order to get our show on the air, we have an amazing staff, amazing support in the community, and we are so happy to be here with you. So remember to tune in and tune into your neighbors and um, be with us. We are a weekly show. Thanks for being with us today. And our guest today, I'm very happy to say, we have uh, Elsie Smith and Serenity Smith Fortune with us. And they are the co-founders of NECA, which is the New England Center for Circus Arts. And they've created here a nexus of circus arts in Brattleboro that's recognized worldwide. It's really a, quite a remarkable thing that we have in this town. As identical twins who specialize in aerial acrobatics, they also created Nimble Arts, which focuses on inventive works of theatrical circus. They are teachers and teacher training, trainers at NECA. They have received many awards over the years, and each has performed with circus companies nationally and internationally. So it's my great pleasure to have on the show today, Elsie and Serenity. Welcome, Elsie, hey. and welcome, Serenity. Yeah, thank it's you. great to see you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Um, well, we have some ground to cover, and one thing that I think would be interesting is to hear just a little bit of your early years, how you grew up. Sure. Um, we grew up actually in Western Massachusetts in a log cabin with no running water and electricity. Um, and then through various ways, our family ended up moving to the Brattleboro area at about the same time as we ran off and went to college and then ran off and joined the circus. So we um, had an unusual childhood that did not involve dance or gymnastics. It involved a lot of climbing trees and helping her dad sawmill. Um, and a lot of academics. Uh, we were both bookworms, geeks, geeks. Um, <laughs> we, university life was interesting and exciting, but we had the chance to try uh, the circus uh, when we were on vacation. And mm -hmm. our mom, we wanted to try the flying trapeze and we thought, well, we couldn't let her try it without us. Um, so we got hooked and ended up leaving university and, uh, Gallivanting around the world, we were actually teaching circus before we ever started to perform it. Really? Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. And so you were together at this point, traveling together and, and doing, doing teaching circus. Yeah, we started out by teaching at a performing arts camp for kids that had a circus program. And we were really lucky that the people running the program there, their focus on circus was using it as an empowerment tool for mm -hmm. young people. So even though we were learning the skills and the techniques of circus, the point of it was to really help the souls of the people who we were working with. Wow. Um, from there, I ended up with an opportunity to perform on Ringling Brothers. I was 18 years old. I was a junior in college. And I thought um, maybe they will hold my scholarship for a year while I go off and test uh, the circus out. And uh, maybe my scholarship is still waiting for me because I never <laughs> Elsie ended up moving to Canada with a sweetheart. Um, she learned trampoline when she was in Canada, got a teacher certificate in that. Um, but that's where our uh, worlds diverged. Elsie became more of a teacher at that point, and I became more of a performer. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And about, I think, seven years later, we reconvened in San Francisco. Francisco and started performing together. So we made it work and we really took all of our teaching experience and put it on our performing endeavors and yeah. I think it must be more successful. But it was about when we were 27 that we started to work with uh, Cirque du Soleil. Yeah. Oh, how exciting. And it was, <laughs> where was that? We were based out of Montreal for the creation of the project. And so we lived there for about eight months. Yeah. And then we were on a four year contract. It was the Asia Pacific division. So we got to live in Australia for a year, uh, Japan for a year, Hong Kong, Singapore. <laughs> yeah, it was just a blast. Oh, wow. Well, you know, you're sort of putting a whole new definition on running off to join the circus. You gotta yes. say, right? Yeah, that's pretty exciting. <laughs> lucky enough to enter the circus world at a time when it's uh it as an industry as an art form was developing and growing to be something really new 
Yes. Yes. And actually, you know, that's one thing that um, I thought would be interesting to get your take on it because the whole, um, I mean, obviously circus has been with us for years and years. We don't probably don't even know how long, um, but um, it's changed so much. The difference between circus from when I was a kid to what you're talking about, it feels to me like that was like maybe the last 25 years or so that it's taken on a new look and a new feel and attracting different kinds of people as well. Yeah, a couple of things happened. One was that it became a risk recreation. It became available to uh -huh. anyone who wanted to put on a safety belt. It's like bungee jumping. And then you got to swing on a flying trapeze. And so this was happening at Club Med and super clubs and uh -huh. at summer camps. So uh -huh. it became populous in a way where anyone can do it. At the same time, places like Cirque du Soleil and the Pickle Family Circus were bringing in the international theatrical aspect of circus and elevating it as an art form. Right. So those two things combined have made it a really different um, thing in our culture, um, especially in the United States where it wasn't really considered an art form until recently. Right, that's right. And as you're, what you say about it being theatrical as well, I think that is a big part. And Cirque du Soleil, I remember when they first came out, it was astounding to see what yeah. they were doing. It was so different. One of the other things that Cirque du Soleil capitalized on that also helped make their particular type of the art form so popular is that they um, connected with uh, TV. And so their circus shows were available to anybody in their living room to watch. Yes. So circus became um, more widely seen. So all of that came to elevate it as an art form in the United States, especially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, and it did. It really did. Um, you know, I want to go back just a little bit because um, you, um, you came from a family that was a combined family and you lived with brothers and sisters who were different ages. You were a bit older than most of your brothers and sisters, but um, you did describe it as being a tribe. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and also um, in relation, the dynamic of that and also in relation to the circus as a tribe as well. Yeah, so we grew up with um, five and then seven siblings, just how the different families came together. Mm -hmm. And it was a homesteading family. So it was more like, you know, what you read on Little House on the Prairie or Laura Ingalls Wilder, where the older siblings are helping to take care of the younger siblings. Everybody has chores. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of childcare and animal husbandry and gardening that is just a natural part of the whole family coming together. Right. All hands on deck. Yeah. And so when we joined the circus, this idea of sort of communally putting all of your efforts in one basket and working towards a greater whole was really natural for us. And the circus is a really unique place, very similar to, I think, uh, people who go off and to do military service mm -hmm. um, or missionary work where you have a very specific vocabulary. Um, you know, if I say a Doniker, or if I say a rolling angel, only people in the circus might know what that is. There's a factor and a safety factor of knowing that you might be going into a dangerous situation and knowing who can help keep you safe. Mm -hmm. um, and you're living and traveling together. And that tribal feeling, um, you know, that we had as a big, group of kids growing up and uh, shifting, moving to Vermont and things like that, that served us really well in the circus. And it's one of the things about the circus that I think I can speak for Serenity as well, that we both are really passionate about, you know, especially in this time of COVID-19 where we, the circus part of it is limited to us. We can't go to our circus building and fly around in the air, but we have a community, we have a tribe that we can reach out to and connect with um, and that uh, circus tribe is just really valuable. Mm -hmm. And viable and alive. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. That's, that's yeah, and I, um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, I think that um, you, you, you also referred to circus as a created family, which I think is a really interesting phrase as well. And I think you've described it really well as too. Um, and so you each have been in traveling circuses and traveling circuses together too, right? 
So yes. you, have you have you ever been a service that's stationary or that's just performance? Yes, our first contract was at a casino. Um, <laughs> so um, I think there was a short casino uh, visit that was in Reno, Nevada, and then we spent the summer in Atlantic City. Uh -huh. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's from one extreme to another extreme, right? Different different coasts almost, yeah. Really nicely in uh, the the circus arts world is that we have performed in what we call mud shows, which is mud, a dirt lot, a tent. Um, you might have a porta potty, um, and uh, you know if it rains in between your acts, then you're outside digging ditches. Yeah. And we've performed in fancy theaters. We've been yeah. able to perform all over the world in top stages. Yeah. Um, and you know, Cirque du Soleil is a very state-of-the-art tent. Uh, so we've been really lucky to be able to perform in a lot, lot of different styles of circus and understand yes. the value. And it, it calls for such flexibility in in many things, <laughs> not only your performances, but where you are and what the conditions are. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's, I like that's to say that we're, we're fairly comfortable in a slick evening gown and equally yeah. comfortable in the boots underneath it. Yeah, that's, that's really, that's interesting. That's a great take, you know, and um, when you did come back to Vermont at some point in all of this, and what brought you back? What was, what was the key there? Well, um, for any performing artist, you need to actually tell the government a particular address that you actually can get taxed at. So for many years, Vermont was our tax address because our father and our younger siblings had moved uh, to Guilford. Uh-huh. And then our dad kept sending us uh, information about the art scene in Brattleboro and what a cool little town it was. And I had lived here for about six months. Uh, we would come back for a couple weeks during contracts. And it was a cool little town. There was a lot happening. Um, it was also much more affordable than these cities, which mm. their compatriots were settling in to do circus, like Montreal and San Francisco and New York City. Right. But Brattleboro was also um, really accessible. So the train going between Montreal and New York City, we could get to the Boston airport very easily to fly to Europe. The Bradley airport is amazing and oh. was easier to get to than the San Francisco airport when we lived in San Francisco and cheaper. <laughs> um, yeah. So there was a lot of things going for Brattleboro. Um, the, the other little thing is we met, um, we met Peter Gould. Uh, in San Francisco because his son was actually working for my dad on the sawmill. So there was a connection. And Peter was one of the people that moved to Brattleboro with the first wave of back to landers. Yes. And um, yeah, the people who were sort of like the hippie commune folks. Yes. So Brattleboro already had experience with freaks and others. And so when we landed and we started to talk about being circus performers and doing circus, mm -hmm. Nobody batted an eyelash. We were just another group of people trying to find a home mm -hmm. in a town that was perfectly happy to have others yeah. um, as part of the town. And so. the state itself has a fairly long history of circus. Um, I had actually come to work for Circus Mercus at their summer camp in, uh, I think it was 1995, so before mm -hmm. I lived here. Um, so Rob Merman had been here for years, founding Circus Mercus by then. Mm -hmm. Troy Wonderly, who is from Bellows Falls um, and has this Wonderly's Big Top Adventures. He'd been off performing with Ringling Brothers. Yes. Ted Lawrence also does circus as local. So it was sort of primed for, um, you know, the kind of aerial circus theater that we do. Yes. Just the acting. it. Yes. Yeah. And this, so it was 2002, I believe, when you established Nimble Arts, yes. which was your first company of your own co-founding. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we came in, we actually finished our Cirque du Soleil contract in uh, about Thanksgiving in 2001. And so by 2002, we had created Nimble Arts and then we were subletting a photography studio at the Cotton Mill mm -hmm. in just south of downtown Brattleboro in order to get a little training space in. We were also going over to New Hampshire to work at the American School of Gymnastics. Mm -hmm. And that's actually when we started teaching our first teenagers mm -hmm. who were circus smirkus kids who needed someplace to train when they weren't on tour. Uh -huh. um, and then it, Nimble Arts just grew organically where we had more people who said, hey, can I have a class? 
class? Would you do a circus camp for kids? Maybe we could do a fitness class in the morning. Can I move here and teach for you? You wow. know, so all of a sudden we had five or six people teaching for us. We mm -hmm. were still traveling quite regularly. And we realized that um, this, was a, this was a bigger thing. We didn't want it to be just about us. And so the idea of creating the New England Center for Circus Arts came, really came from people in Brattleboro and people from all over the world saying, we really like what you do. Can you do more of it? And can you create a better venue? So the cotton mill was wonderful. We also have space over at the Winston Prouty Gym, mm -hmm. but it's into our trapezium. It doesn't hold a candle to having 40 foot ceilings and heated floors yeah. and giant natural light windows. Yes. Um, I do want to go slightly back and say at the beginning of Nimble Arts, one of the huge um, sort of gifts that was given to us is the Brattleboro Development Credit, Un Credit Corporation that owns the Cotton Mill and they are a supporter of up and coming businesses. Mm -hmm. They really made it affordable for us to take a chance on renting our own space. Yeah. We also have a small business course through the SBDCC, like um, that. and that was uh, free because we were new business owners, and that was a fabulous resource to help us get started. Another thing um, that you mentioned was uh, coming into um, a certain level of establishment of circus in Vermont, and you used the phrase creating a warm seat, mm -hmm. right? I wonder if you could tell the folks about that. In, in the theater, Theater, um, it's talked about when someone um, leaves the stage from, an, from their act that they can sort of suck all the energy and take it with them and maybe they were fabulous or they can kind of leave the theater the stage warm for the next performer and um, we really felt like we were coming into a warm stage both just the creative environment that's here the awareness that the creative arts sector mm -hmm. is really to the economy. Mm -hmm. So when we went to uh, Brattleboro Savings and Loan and said, hey, we want to build a building, will you be our banker? You know, that, that stage was warm for us. Mm -hmm. They understood the value of arts in the community. We didn't have to convince them of right. it. Right, right. As well as the other perform, the Wonderlies who are already here in Circus Smirkus and all of that as, as far as your actual performance goes. Yes. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Stephen Stearns for the New England Youth yes. Theater was mm -hmm. brought us into this group of um, just creative people who are trying to make a downtown um, sort of consortium mm -hmm. of arts, not just performing arts, but the River Gallery School, mm -hmm. the Brattleboro Museum and Arts Center. I mean, the yeah. list goes on. It's I, amazing, doing, isn't it? If we're doing shout outs for people, we should also do a shout out for, for Eric Bass at St. Mm -hmm. Glass Theater. Absolutely. Um, was teaching at Marlboro College at the time and yeah. helped set up a photo shoot and then we ended up doing some artistic collaborations together. Yes, yeah, oh, I know. We could do a list of shout outs, you know. It's really, it's amazing how and how supportive the whole community is to each other and for each other. You have a line in, uh, in your website and for folks um, in the audience, we will have all this information at the end of the show. Uh, the website for NECA, Nimble Arts, etc. Um, but one of the lines is the transformative power of circus arts, circus arts to realize their dreams, people who participate. And I thought about that phrase, and I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit, maybe from your own lives. What, what is the dream for you that was realized? Um, well, I'll just start by saying that's the, um, the mission statement of the New England Center for Circus Arts. And um, our first mission statement had to do with building a home. And so once our building was built, we uh, went back and reviewed the mission statement and added in that piece about transformation. Uh -huh. um, it's always been really clear to Elsie and I that um, transformation and uh, teaching to the heart is different for different people. Um, so if someone is an aspiring performer with Cirque du Soleil, they're gonna come in with a really different goal for transformation Mm -hmm. than a young person who is homeless um, and their need for transfer transformation is going to be really different mm -hmm. and our goal as a school is to be agile enough and um, free from our own conceptions of what someone needs to be able to really serve each person as they come in and have a breadth of services for them.
Yeah. Um, so really uh, what the mission statement means for us. Yeah. Um, now I'm wondering if Elsie has a story to tell about transformation in her own life. <laughs> well, I wasn't thinking about our lives as much as I was thinking of the transformation of some of the students that we have. And um, we have, a, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, the idea of the other and the freak is something that this circus has been known for for a long time. Um, and that's becoming a bit normalized with circus being, you know, Troy Wonderly's teaching circus in schools and the Waldorf schools have circus. And so it's normalized. But we are still a safe place for people who don't feel like they have safe places and some other places in their lives. Um, we had uh, a young lady who was from Western Massachusetts who was super, super bendy. She was a natural contortionist. And in her regular classroom and at her high school she was thought of as a bit of a freak she was an outsider she was also really cerebral she had the entire harry potter books memorized it's very unusual a uh, young woman when she found the circus she found a place where her freakishness was normal and also put her on a pedestal because she was actually quite good at her contortion. She is now um, a graduate of the Circus Mercus Tour. She's a graduate of our professional training program. And she's 10 years later, she's a very well-known contortionist based in the Midwest. So yeah. she's taken that freak quality and through right. the, found a profession, a tribe, a community validation. There's dozens of stories, hundreds of stories like that um, we have a huge LGBTQ population that can find, you know, you might be a gendered male and like to wear what would be considered female clothing. And regardless of what your um, sexuality is, that ability to sort of costume yourself and whatever you feel like on a particular day is very normal in the circus. Yes. Um, so yeah. And there's a lot of that. Yeah, well, it's very exciting because, you know, the fact of circus itself becoming more mainstream over these last 25 years or so, and then for you to be incorporating all of these different people and people with different ideas and people with different proclivities and to have a safe place where this can happen. And I know that um, in, in, um, in addition to that, that safety is a really big issue for you as well in teaching and in the trapezium. Yes, uh, we're both on uh, national safety committees through the American Circus Educators um, Organization. Uh, we've set up national conferences that now happen twice a year, or not twice a year, every other year. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we find that it's really important to be able to sit down with our peers and talk about best practices, risk assessment, risk management, um, and also there's, there's physical safety but there's also mental health safety and things mm -hmm. that we find that are really important to talk about as a community. Um, NECA, you know, we're the New England Center for Circus Arts, but we are trying to set ourselves up on the national stage so that we can help with the national conversation around circus arts education. Oh, that's really um, exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to mention also the safety part of it that's not just physical safety. Um, with the whole Me Too movement that happened, um, it, you know, it, it is still happening, but really came to a forefront maybe two years ago. One of the things that we did internally at NECA is to try to formalize the conversation about consent. Um, and we reached out to other people who've been doing this for longer and had more depth of knowledge about it. And then try to bring in um, the idea of touch consent um, really uh, intentionally into our teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, so I through. And I think it's really important to teach young people that they have a say, both, in, both yes and no, in what is consent to touch. So right. the, the idea of safety isn't just physical. There's right. a lot of things that we can teach safe practices. Yes. Well, your teaching is very broad. You're teaching your experience and you're performing. It's all so broad. And, you know, we're talking again about um, the human touch. And here we are in a situation, you know, where human touch is really uh, something that we're all longing for, you know. And um, 
I think that, like I said, I think we're all doing incredibly well with it. Um, however, for you folks, um, can you talk a little bit about what it's been like for you during the coronavirus and that lack and how you how, how are you continuing on with NECA? Well, I'd like to start with a real positive and yes, it, uh, you know, we shut our doors and, you know, had to be really creative about what we could offer when yeah. physical proximity wasn't available. And so we actually have launched a whole bunch of virtual circus classes okay. that I think I would have felt comfortable doing before this because believe it or not, I'm not particularly happy to be on camera, <laughs> but it's been beautiful. I'm teaching five to um, six hours a week. And in one class, I'll have 40 students from all over the world. And that would not oh, have wow. happened. It's amazing. It's beautiful. And they're, they're meeting each other also. You know, they'll say to, you know, someone who's in Colorado, oh, I've heard of you. It's nice to see you. Yeah. Ah. So that's a really beautiful thing that's happened out of this. It kind that's of nudged yeah. And those classes, um, we also, like we offer like a five week class where you can join five weeks in a row. But we also have what we call mini classes, which are 30 to 45 minutes. And it's just a one time thing. And these are all classes that don't use any circus apparatus. So they're available to anybody who's interested mm -hmm. in the topic. If you want to learn how to have a better, stronger toe point, mm -hmm. if you want to learn how what muscles help you straighten out your legs. Um, I did a workshop on doorway fitness, which is all the different stretches and conditioning things you can do using your doorway. I live in a tiny house, so I've had to be extra creative about what <laughs> I can do. We know that there's a lot of people out there who don't, don't even have a playground and don't have the joyful things that we have in Vermont where we have this beautiful outdoor playground that we can still access. Right, right. So we create classes for anybody has been really a, a real positive. Yeah. We do miss getting up in the air. We do miss playing with our friends in the giant, beautiful trapezium that we have. Um, but we trust that we're going to be there and we're going to learn so much about ourselves in the process. Serenity and Elsie, um, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for being with us. And um, uh, any, last, any last words that you would like to, to throw into this? I always just want to say thank you to our greater community and the businesses in town and the folks at the state of Vermont who help NECA be here right now. Uh, we had a rocky moments at, as we moved into our new building and then now of course is rocky for a lot of people. And without the support of our small bank, the Brattleboro Savings and Loan um, and the state of Vermont, we would not be here. And it's just uh, really means a lot to us to have the support of our community. Yep. Yes, yeah, and Brattleboro is a great supportive community. Serenity, anything, any words? I, I just want to, you know, basically second that and yeah. um, you know, from our students to our donors to our supporters. Um, we're, we anticipate being able to weather this challenge, um, but it's only because they're mm -hmm. here for us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that underlines everything that we're all going through right now, you know, with these, these big banners of Stronger Together, it's true. It's absolutely true. Um, so thank you. Um, it's really wonderful, wonderful to have you on the show. I really enjoyed it. And um, we'll see you soon, I hope. We'll see you soon. We'll see you soon, I hope. We always yeah. say see you down the road. That's the circus term. So we're Oh, good. Road. See you down the road. We'll see you down Putney Road, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thanks so much. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for being here with us. It was great to have Serenity and Elsie on. Um, I do want to mention a couple things. Uh, for those of you, um, we will have the credits at the end, of course, for their websites. There's also a wonderful time lapse of them setting up their um, their freestanding rig, which is really fun. You can Google that. Um, and also, both Elsie and Serenity were on this wonderful series called Her America, which is real women's stories from across America. It's a real short little video, but it's very sweet and it really captures 
um, the spirit of NECA. Um, also, when things are back in the trapezium, don't miss Serenity and Elsie. They are an incredible duo uh, when they perform together, and the trapezium itself is a wonder. So um, be sure to stay tuned, and thanks for being with us today. We're very happy to be with you, and remember to carry on and keep talking. We'll be here next week. Thank you.